Hello and welcome to the inaugural episode of Interview with a Dev. I am your host Cosmic and with me today is none other than Carolina Mastretta. Did I get that right? Yeah, well, Carol. It's Carol fine. it is. So Carol is a game designer for Relic Entertainment and they are currently developing the new RTS, Dawn of War 3. So Carol, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. Nice to be here. So before we talk about Dawn of War 3 and get into all those juicy details, tell us a little bit about yourself and the job you do. What do you do day to day? Yeah, so I work at Relic Entertainment as a game designer on DAO 3. I'm part of the of the color development team, so my focus is mostly on development of gameplay and progression systems. I'm glad you mentioned that actually, because the one of the things that I was really interested in ever since the original announcement of Dawn of War Three is how progression systems would be implemented in the new game. But we'll talk about that a bit later. First, with the announcement of Dawn of War Three, it comes at a time where we have a lot of Warhammer 40k games on the market ever since the demise of THQ. The license has opened up and most of those games have been pretty subpar compared to the time of THQ and Relic was pretty instrumental in that by creating some of the best Warhammer 40k games of all time to date. And I wanted to ask, why is it now that Relic has decided to bring Dawn of War 3 to the table? Why have you guys decided that now is the time to announce this game? to come back um so dawn of war is a huge part of relic legacy um as an ip that as a company as gamers ourselves we absolutely love and so dow 3 is a game that we wanted to go forward with for a long time and we've been working on it for the past three years so it just it made sense um for us to come out now with what we believe is the best dawn of war that we've put forward um, and the other thing that's important is that we've been very inspired by how the strategy space has changed over the past few years, right? And so we wanted to take what's been the best um, elements of our Dawn of War 1 and Dawn of War 2 and bring people back what's new, because certainly that part of the industry has been waiting for a long time for the next awesome RTS to come out. That's true, because we don't get a lot of really good RTSs anymore, and the genre is pretty bland in that way. And I'm glad you mentioned the combination of Dawn of War 1 and Dawn of War 2, because it was something that piqued my interest when you guys first announced it, was the fact that you explained the game in those terms. And it was something that I wanted to ask you about, because... The two games were great, both great games in their own right, but they were very different. Dawn of War 1 was, of course, a very traditional RTS, whereas Dawn of War 2 was more in the style of Company of Heroes in the sense that it was a squad-based tactics game. So how are you going to combine the two, and how is that going to translate into the third game? How does that work? Yeah, so from Dawn of War 1 specifically, what we thought was peculiar and absolutely amazing, where it was the, the large armies, right? The ability to build a massive army to clash against other people's massive armies. And from Dawn of War 2, what, our, what ourselves and people loved uh, uh, very, very much were the heroes, right? Mm -hmm. Heroes with very unique abilities um, and different ways to influence the battlefield. But what we noticed um, looking back, um, especially at Dawn 2, is just the fact that heroes felt outstanding from the army, right? They felt like something different that you weren't uh, using in, in like in an orchestrated strategy, right? So what we want to do with Dow 3 is bring those elements that were so loved by the fans and by us and turn them into something that is the core of the game. Is this epic heroes with awesome abilities working alongside the big massive armies um, in an orchestrated strategy, right? So they don't feel like two different parts of something. They're both part of a whole. Right. So it's very much in the style of something like the old Warcraft games where you have hero units and then you have your normal squad units and both complement yeah. each other each way. Now, one thing that I picked up on was the idea of going back to Dawn of War 1 in terms of a bigger scale warfare style game. And I wanted to ask you about that specifically about the units so you've included the imperial knights which are ginormous and it's the biggest unit you've put into a game to date what other units can we expect yeah so we recently actually um showed the elder army and as part of the elder army we showed uh, Taldir, who's a wraith knight right. 
Um, she's, uh, well, there's actually a Wraith Knight that's uh, your opponent at the very end of the mission that we've been showcasing. So those are the two super units that we've shown. There is going to be more to come, but we haven't shared details on those yet. Right, because you have three playable factions at launch. You have Space Marines, Eldar, yes. and Orcs. Now, how are you guys going to ensure that those three factions, from a gameplay perspective, are going to feel unique and different and have different play styles? Yeah, well, that's um, it's, that's actually a really good point. Uh, the decision for those three armies, um, it, it's always hard. We look at many, many different things, right, like legacy, etc. Uh, from a game design standpoint, I can tell you that what makes it awesome uh, as a trio is the relationships between the three. They These are factions that are radically different, right? Like, they all have very peculiar elements to their personality and they contrast so much uh, to each other that they make it for a nice bundle um, to start with. So, in terms of uh, your second question, which was how do we differentiate them? So. That's something that you can see on the gameplay demos that we've been showing. Each faction has what we call faction abilities, right? That differentiate the way that you execute their your army strategy and use the units themselves. So for Space Marines, to give you an example, we have the mechanic of drop pods, um, which we call death from above. So a Space Marine player has the ability to build units as they unlock their tech tree build units into their dropouts. And those dropouts can be deployed right in the middle of the field whenever you need them, um, turning the tide of a battle. So the reason why we look at that when designing features like that is, okay, would Space Marines ever retreat? Would Space Marines ever like not make it to the middle of the battlefield? No, this is not their personality, right? Um, and then looking at Eldar, so again, we shared them recently and we talked a bit about um, Fleet of Foot. So Fleet of Foot is a mechanic that allows Eldar to move quickly, to strike and attack and retreat to spaces where they can be safe. Um, Eldar, they're a scarce faction, right? There's not a lot of them left. And so they do care about losing numbers in the battlefield. So when building their faction mechanics, we look at how would, I, would, I, would an army that cares about losing units, how would they fight, right? They would fight with shields that when they're depleted, they can retreat back to a place where they can heal them back up again. Um, so that gives you an idea of how we're shaping this mechanics for the factions around their personality that makes them unique. And um, we can't talk a bit, well, too much about orcs just yet, but they're going to be along the same tone. Yeah. Just right. I mean, because the orcs have got, you know, certain things in their law that will be interesting to see translated into mechanics like the idea of their war and how that will translate into the game will be interesting to see now with the factions being so different and with different play styles do you then run the risk of things like multiplayer becoming very unbalanced and having a faction that is going to be possibly op yeah well so balance is something that's very important to us and we see balance as an endeavor that not only has to take place now as part of the dev efforts but also post launch right uh, we need to observe how players are using these armies and then react based on that you're right in that yes like these are immensely complex games and when when features make it to people's hands and <laughs> we start to like exploit certain strategies, etc. like we'll have to reassess. But um, right now what we what we do on a daily basis is play the hell out of the game and then notice what, what traits are not balanced and then go back to the drawing board, fix a couple of issues. There's lots of tuning going on on a daily basis. Um, but yeah, the complexity is absolutely a challenge. One of the things that really impressed me about the, even the pre-alpha game footage that was shown at E3 was the level design. And I thought that it was really impressive how the levels had a sense of verticality to them. And then you also had, you know, Gabriel Anzulos jumping over a chasm to get a, another enemy unit. And you had, you even got to see him smash down on the ground and part of the edge of the cliff fall off. And I wanted to ask how important is the level design to the overall gameplay and is the environments going to affect the gameplay in some way to the point where, you know, having certain terrains is going to be, 
a strategic advantage and you can use the terrain to your advantage to get the you know the up on your opponent um absolutely the that uh, mission that map is a really good uh, showcase of what you're going to be dealing with um so like you said there is verticality to the maps and um, that changes of course uh, the vision game between the units right like do you do you have an advantage by being on top um, do I have an advantage by taking this piece of cover that's above this contended point or whatever? And um, yes, another what, something that we care a lot about is counterplay, right? So a unit like Gabriel Angelo, say that you have a piece of cover that's at top of a ledge, right? Um, units in that cover are going to have an advantage against anybody that's below here, right? But a unit like Gabriel Angelo's can jump straight into cover um, and remove those units from there. So we, when we design the maps, we definitely look back at our units um, and vice versa and think about how we can make them feel like they belong as part of that world and for these maps and this map mechanics to make sense to the abilities and vice versa. I'm glad you mentioned cover uh, because that was something I was going to ask about because in Dawn of War 1, you did have a cover system, but it was like units would just get buffs in craters and things like that. But then in Dawn of War 2, you had very much a cover system that was a linear cover system that was constant throughout levels. They would hide behind walls and that kinds of thing. How is the cover system going to work in Dawn of War 3 when you are you know, transferring a lot of mechanics back to a traditional RTS? How does that translate into the game? How is that going to be implemented? So what we've done with cover is made it capturable space. So you're either in cover or you're out of cover. And in the process, you're capturing the cover. So units go into this piece that can be captured. While it's captured, the cover is going to take any damage in coming into that space. Um, and this actually created a really interesting role for melee units. Um, ranged units won't be able to go into cover, but melee units can walk right in and either kill the enemies that are taking the cover or like Gabriel Angelos use a knockback ability to remove them from that space. Um, so we wanted to make sure that cover was something that is very readable to both the player and the opponent, right? So like I said, I'm either in cover and all these units are in cover or they're not. Um, in the midst of a very, very complex battle, right? Like we have massive armies, heroes with different abilities, etc. We wanted to make sure that the complexity is in how you're placing those placing your units about the battlefield, where which type which pieces of cover you're taking, how are you engaging units that are within cover, and not put the player's uh, hesitation on like are my units in cover or are they not? Is this you know, because in a again in the midst of such a complex battle you need to be able to see to digest information in a very fast way um and so that's why the solution made sense to us now one thing that was interesting was that i as particularly in the pre-alpha footage was when the imperial knight was using her missile barrage and the player was actually directly controlling where those missiles and those attacks were landing and it seems like a lot of the abilities that units have require an arc or you know a direct player interface to show um, where you want to attack or even controlling a beam directly until the actual ability is over and i wanted to ask you about that why is it that you have decided to give the players that much control especially considering the fact that there's so much going on on the battlefield. Um, you mean to add that much complexity? Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, in terms of complexity, you have not only then your units, and especially in such large-scale battles, you have all these units going on and all these things, different things going on, and then on top of that, you have to manage your um, like elite abilities and directing you know, faction mechanics and all that, all that kind of thing. Why have you given players so much control and so much to do? So it depends. Um, there are units that have a lot of complexity and, and we actually have a spectrum in which they can measure. So there's units that have a lot of given complexity um, and units that are simpler or like faster to use, right? right. But um, one note there is that a, a value that we've brought forward across our design process is what we call uh, opt-in complexity. 
So you, so f to give you an example with Gabriel Angelos, um, his retribution ability, his lamps, uh, well, he actually does like a roll with his hammer and creates a, a, a bubble around him. So that does area of effect damage, which immediately knocks back and does damage to units that are within range. But it also leaves a bubble um, aura right. that right. Gabriel can uh, walk away from. And that aura actually reflects projectiles. So that's something that on the, the first time you use that ability, you're going to see the quick effect, right? I did damage. I disengaged melee units attacking me. Great. Um, a more advanced player will notice that that ability reflected projectiles. Um, and this is a type of complexity that we wanted to add. It's something that you don't need to know from the get-go. Right. But right. when you understand it, you can use it to your advantage. Um, in terms of complexity of execution, like the ability that you mentioned from Solaria, where you have to target um, like one to six different positions, um, those units come late in the game, right? We have what we call elite point cost. So you, so you deploy these units on a time basis. And so Solaria is a unit that would come in um, late in the game and you, it's gonna, she's gonna cost a lot of, <laughs> a lot of um, damage to players, armies, etc. And we also want to give you ownership of, well, not ownership, but agency over what that ability can do. And again, it's such a powerful ability and with so much um, breadth of what it can do, right? It can attack buildings, it can attack, it can delete, really disrupt infantry blobs. So that's just giving the player choice on what you want the, the ability to do and how you want to execute it. Now, harkening back to earlier on in the conversation where we were talking about progression, Dawn of War 2 had, in my opinion, a really great progression system because you had gear progression, you had individual unit progression, you had ability progression. What kind of progression can we expect in Dawn of War 3? Is there going to be gear progression for elite units? Is there going to be progression for normal units? How is it going to work? So we haven't shared too many details about our progression system, but I can speak to the value driving them. So we want, like I mentioned, for elites to have an impact in the rest of your army and for there to be synergy between them. So in terms of progression, uh, what we're doing differently is making sure that elites, um, as they gain experience and level up, they're actually opening up the ways in which they can influence the rest of the army. So we're less focused on giving you ways to change a unit's role and more giving you opportunities to influence the battlefield in different ways. So to give you a tangible example that we've shown um, on our gameplay videos, this one was through um, our creative director that played the mission online, is um, Gabriel Angelos. So like I mentioned earlier, Space Marines have an ability, well, basically drop pods to deploy units within the field. Gabriel Angelos uh, can choose to bring um, an upgrade that makes it so those drop pods actually uh, heal units when they drop in. So that can give you an idea of how elites are influencing the battlefield and the kinds of choices that you're making. And it's also a good example of how we're focusing on how the, those these elites can influence and have an impact on the rest of the army and the player strategy. So one of the last things I wanted to touch on was the main campaign. I'm a big fan of the main campaigns in both Dawn of War games. And I wanted to ask you how this campaign is going to work because I'm a big fan of the Eldar. And I always feel like we've been shafted when it comes to narrative in the campaigns because it's always been so Space Marine focused. So how are you going to include the non-Space Marine races in the new campaign? So in DAO 3, you're actually playing a linear campaign where you're playing at all the different factions at different points in time. So you're starting as Space Marines and then moving forward, the next mission that you play may be Orcs or it may be Eldar. So you're playing through the entire experience from different points of view, um, and that doesn't mean that you can like that. That's going to change what you view depending on which faction you've played before, etc. It just means that throughout the campaign, we're giving you um, each mission is an opportunity to get the different to get to know the different factions um, and learn how their mechanics influence uh, your playstyle. That sounds great because that's quite interesting. Uh, and quite different from yeah. what we've had previous to that because 
you know, previously we had, you know, a choice-based system where you could go, especially in Dawn of War 2, you could go to different planets, you could make your own choices of where to go. So this one seems to be a lot more linear. Does that mean it's going to be a lot more narratively focused and story-driven? It's Yes, absolutely. Um, basically, the three warring factions, Elder, the Space Marines, and Orcs are drawn to this mysterious planet called Acheron. Right. Um, and this planet is said to, like, there's a legend that says that there is a very powerful and mystical weapon hidden there. And so for very different reasons in 40k, <laughs> these three factions are drawn to this planet in pursuit of this weapon for very different reasons, right? Um, in the midst of trying to fight for this weapon and for supremacy, um, Gabriel Angelos, Maka, and Gorgots, um, which are known characters of our franchise, basically bring forward their armies and all their anger at each other and clash in epic fights until they actually realize that the, th the planet hosts a much larger threat for all of them. Well, Carol, thank you for so much for taking <laughs> our time to speak with us today. If you guys want more information on Dawn of War 3, head on over to dawnofwar.com and sign up to the newsletter there. As for this channel, subscribe for more interviews, previews and reviews. And as always, I will see you next time.